Good morning and welcome to Sunday School for April 18th. Uh, my name is Brandon Keaton and I'm the Director of Music Ministries here at First Methodist in Albany. And today we're going to be looking at a passage from Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to look at uh, 17 through 32. And we're going to talk about what it is to be a new person and what it is to be that new person in Christ. Well, we're probably familiar with uh, Ephesians because it's a, it's a beautiful, uh, short, six-chapter uh, letter that was written by the Apostle Paul. And uh, many think of it as a circular letter, which basically meant that it was one that could go around to uh, several different churches in a region. So it would have gone to um, more than just the church at Ephesus, but also other churches in the province, uh, the Roman province of Asia, there in what is now Western Turkey. And so Paul spends um, a good bit of time in the first three chapters of Ephesians talking about redemption, what that means, and how that it is a gift of God that comes through faith in Jesus Christ, and that there is nothing that his readers can say or do uh, that will... Uh, make that any better or, or worse for that matter, that there's nothing that they need to do other than receive the gift of God. They can't merit it on their own. But then in chapter 4, he goes on to talk about some of the moral and ethical uh, parts of the message of grace. And so oftentimes he'll refer to uh, this type of thing as the fruit of the light, the fruit of righteousness, or uh, even like the fruit of the Spirit. He doesn't necessarily use these terms in this passage, but uh, those are some of the ones he uses in other places like in Philippians and in the book of Galatians. But so in this section, uh, Paul is going to pick up on what he started in the very first uh, verse of chapter 4, where he tells his readers to walk worthy of the calling that they have in Christ. And so he picks up on that idea of, of walking. And the translation that I'm using, the NIV, does not say that specifically, but I'll mention it whenever we get whenever we get to it. But um, he he uses it as an in a negative way. Don't don't walk in the way of the of, of unbelievers, and then in a positive way, walking in the light of Christ. And so he sets up a contrast of, uh, you know, a then and now contrast where uh, sometimes, uh, you know, the things beforehand, uh, before salvation, before redemption, and then the things after that, after meeting Christ. Well, so let's go ahead and dive right into Ephesians 4. We'll start at 17, and we'll go through 19 right now. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed." Now it's kind of funny that he starts out this way. He, you know, he says, "Don't don't live," which means do not walk like the Gentiles. Uh, of course, we talk about our Christian walk, but we're talking about our Christian lifestyle, and that's what he's getting at here. But it's kind of funny that he says, "Don't act like the Gentiles do." Well, everybody in Ephesus just about was a Gentile, and so he is making a contrast between unbelieving Gentiles and believing Gentiles. So Paul insists that his Gentile readers no longer live as the unregenerate or unbelieving Gentiles do, um, you know, in their pagan lifestyle. So it's uh, notable here uh, Paul's emphasis on their thinking. You know, that's, that's, he, he, he gets to that, that part of where he says, you know, unsaved Gentiles um, have a futile thinking, you know, they have futility of their thinking, they're darkened intellects, and they're spiritually ignorant. 
You know, he doesn't really mince words when it comes right down to it, you know, because uh, once they have seen the truth that is in Jesus, then they, of course, are made new. So unregenerate or unbelieving people uh, who live according to their sinful nature are characterized by futility. Now, uh, you know, futility in their thinking or in their minds. Uh, and, you know, sometimes... Uh, I, we've, I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like um, <laughs> everything we do sometimes feels futile. It feels like, well, am I doing any good? Am, 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 I, am I making a difference in the world? Uh, am I making a difference in the life of people that I come in contact with? And so this is not something that's just a question for uh, unbelievers, but you know, even for believers, we have to, we kind of have to uh, deal with that from time to time. How, how does that, how does that feel? Well, you know, futile thinking, uh, a darkened intellect, um, and even if we're brilliant, you know, if we have a, have a high IQ and we have a lot of learning, uh, we can still be spiritually ignorant. And, and of course, that spiritual ignorance uh, begins with the deliberate rejection of the moral light and God's known truth. Paul talks about this at length in Romans chapter 1. He goes on and on and on about it. You know, so the steps that are mentioned here in this passage in the downward spiral, of course, we've seen that there they have first comes the hardening of their hearts. And that results in a deep-seated ignorance. And then we see that depraved Gentiles are darkened in their understanding or in their intellect. And so that separates them from the life of God. And then finally, they lose all moral sensitivity and give themselves over to sensuality, etc., etc. I want to say that one of the... Uh, hardest things that that we have to deal with as Christian believers is allowing things to uh, allowing things to uh, get easier over time like to you know when we start to see sins in our lives and things we don't really like, things we know that God doesn't like, the more we don't deal with them, the more they become easier to commit. And sometimes it's not even a sin. Sometimes it's something great. Sometimes it's our job. Sometimes it's our family. Things that get in the place or take the place of the love that we have for God uh, that we had when we met the Lord. And so it's very easy to lose that, to lose that first love. So often through the New Testament, uh, the writers talk about losing that love. And this is one of those things that I think that Paul's getting at, is that we have to be careful and always vigilant to not allow that to happen. It happens so often in our relationships, um, and it, and there are cycles, there are ebbs and flows of things. We're not going to have a mountaintop experience every single time that we come for Bible study, or that we come to worship, or that we have our private time with the Lord. But uh, by continually being in the presence of the Lord, we are able to guard our hearts and our minds from that kind of ignorance. Well, then moving on to, uh, chap uh, to verse 20 through 24, it says, That, however, is not the way of life you learned. So rather than that ignorant life, now he's going to talk about the new life that's in Christ. And so he says, that, however, is not the way of life you learned. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Okay, so like we said, Paul is contrasting the old self 
the sinful self uh, and the former way of life with the new self, the new life that is in Christ, you know, that Christ has created spiritually and morally in us to be like him and to be like God to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So whereas unbelieving, unrepentant Gentiles uh, were characterized by all those, you know, that hardness, that darkness, and the ignorance, well now believers, on the other hand, come to know or literally have learned Christ. They've learned him. They've, they have watched the life of Christ in Paul and in the other uh, others that are leaders in their um, religious community, and so their hearts are no longer darkened by uh, by this ignorance, and they are no longer characterized by alienation or impurity or sensuality. So this this dramatic change occurs when someone has learned Christ, when they have heard him or heard of him and been taught. In him. So the, the expression learned Christ, uh, the Greek word for that basically means to be discipled. And just for your information, um, to be a disciple in Greek is, math is a mathete, mathete. And so if we ever say mathetai, you are, uh, uh, it means uh, disciples. So uh, not that you're ever going to have to know that, but if I ever call you that, uh, then know that I'm not saying ugly things to you, that I'm calling you disciples, and that's a good thing. <laughs> but uh, to be a mathete, to be a disciple, and so then to, you have heard him, the next expression, um, after having learned him, you heard him, means that the Gentile converts had heard the voice of Christ through the preaching of the gospel. And they had third been taught in him as the sphere of their life. All of their life was encompassed in the framework, in the, in the point of view of Christ. Verse 21 adds the truth that is in Jesus. Paul does not refer usually to Christ simply by his historical name. That he does here, and so strongly affirms that, Christ, that the Christ of faith is the Jesus of history, and he is the embodiment of truth. Fundamental to what the Gentile converts had learned and been taught in Christ were two truths, and these are really important. Number one is that a believer at conversion has put off the old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires in verse 22. Now, there are many people who believe that Christianity is self-help club. And if we can just uh, live right and pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, everything will be okay. But here's the thing. There is nowhere in scripture that ever talks about that. Not one place. And here, in particular, Paul is basically saying, and he's reminding us, that the old self is not something to be, made, to be made better or to be improved. The old self needs to die and be buried in order that a whole new life can emerge. So in God's order, death precedes life. Crucifixion precedes resurrection. That is maybe one of the most important things we will ever learn is that the old self needs to die. I can't make it better. There's nothing I can do. I need to be in Christ. And then second, we learn that the believer at conversion has put on the new self, which is created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness in verse 24. So we put off all of the old and we put on the new. Paul calls what we were uh, before and at, what we were before and after conversion as literally the old man and the new man. 
the old person and the new person. The former, the old, is decrepit, deformed, and tends toward corruption. The latter, the new man, the new person, is fresh, beautiful, and vigorous. This is the way Paul's Gentile readers had learned Christ and been taught in him. The line of demarcation between the old life in sin and the new life in Christ was to be clear and decisive. Now, of course, he is talking about a process. He doesn't mean that, like, boom, one day you're this, and boom, one day you're that. Uh, he's talking about a process that is involved in putting off and in putting on. So, renewing the mind is a work of the Holy Spirit, whereby our former futile thinking and darkened intellects are changed so that we come to be filled with Christ's way of thinking, a daily and continuous inward renewal of our outlook is involved in being a Christian. We have to do it. We have to continue to work that out. Because believers are a new creation in Christ, we must no longer live like we did before we knew him. Now then, let's move to these, the last uh, verses uh, 25 through 32. So Paul has contrasted the old self and the new self, uh, the sinful nature and the nature of Christ, the new life that's in Christ. And then in verse 25, he says, therefore. Of course, we know that uh, the question that we have to ask is, what is the therefore, therefore? And so, therefore, is the bridge between the principal and the practice. So he's told us the principle, and now he's going to tell us how to put it into practice. So in verse 25, he, he begins with five things that, you know, these five things uh, concern our relationships, not only with Christ and with God, but with other people. So here, let's look at these examples of righteous living. The first, in verse 25, Therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Okay, well, we're, we're to put away lying and, and to speak truthfully. Well, that sounds easy enough, doesn't it? So, you know, to do away with falsehood, to speak, in the, speak truthfully, is in keeping with who we are as believers in Christ, being in Christ. You know, the truth is in Jesus, like we saw back in verse 21. So, believers must renounce the lies of the devil and all the lesser lies that the old self told us. We have, we believe so many things about ourselves that are not true, okay? And we, what we need to do is believe and conform to what Christ thinks of us and to what we, and who we are in Christ. Not that I can do anything with it, but by being in Christ, God sees us as his own son, as his own child. So this command means first that we are to speak truthfully with our neighbors. Okay, you know, we were commanded to love all, love everyone, so we need to be truthful with them. But even more so, uh, we must relate and speak truthfully and in a trustworthy manner with all the people who are in the body of Christ. You can't build trust by not being truthful. So we avoid things like deceitful scheming and backbiting and gossiping as much as we possibly can because we want, we want to avoid it like the plague, basically. Oh my goodness, we all, we all understand that a whole lot better than we, than we used to, don't we? So fellowship is built on trust and trust is built on truth. So falsehood undermines fellowship while truth strengthens it. Now then, secondly, in verses 26 and 27, it says, In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. So we've had putting away lying and speaking truthfully, and then number two, do not sin through anger. Now, here is the thing. You know, it says, In your anger, do not sin. Now, oftentimes, people will read this as a, um, 
as license to be zealously angry. Okay, or uh, you know, it. But that may not be exactly what what Paul is getting at. In fact, I don't, I don't really think it is. You know, oftentimes this is translated as a command: be angry and do not sin. As if Paul is encouraging some kind of righteous indignation or something like that. But this misses the point of his thought in this context, because in this context it is, in effect, a warning about sinful anger. So Paul's thought is, if you become angry, be careful, beware, you are at sin's door. If, you know, th that's the thing is that we, we oftentimes will get angry and sin. We will say something that we shouldn't say, whether that's some, some foul talk or whether that's something we shouldn't say to somebody, or we will uh, have some outburst or whatever. Nobody ever looks very good um, having an outburst. <laughs> I mean, when you think about it anyway, but... Uh, that's, it, it makes us feel more alienated, and it's so destructive, um, and it's such a characteristic of the old self. So Paul places three restrictions then on anger, each of which calls attention to its potential danger. First, he says, do not sin. So anger, of course, this indicates that anger easily leads to sin. And, you know, and that can be something like pride or malice or vengeance or rage or violence or even murder. Second, do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. You know, settle accounts quickly. Don't, don't let bitterness take hold of you. Remember what they said about bitterness. And it's never good. And then, do, then third, do not give the devil a foothold. This indirectly warns us that anger can easily open a door of opportunity for the devil to sneak in and take over, or at least lead us into something that we really should not do. All right, so that's do not sin through anger. Then third, in these uh, examples, these practical examples of righteous living, Paul mentions in verses 28, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Interesting, you know, this is an old command. I mean, it's in the uh, Ten Commandments, you know, not to steal. And so Paul mentions it here. Um, and mentions uh, thieves among those who trans um, those transgressors who cannot inherit the kingdom of God. He says this in 1 Corinthians chapter six verse ten. So, but when a thief is converted to Christ, uh, then that person has to stop stealing and then learn to work, work diligently, doing something that is useful, useful or beneficial not only to himself and to his, to the to the family, but to the family of believers. So true believers engage in, <coughs> excuse me, in honest labor and don't cheat their employers or their employees. They share and they demonstrate generosity to each other. <coughs> excuse me. In conversion, putting off the old self, the unregenerated um, sinful lifestyle that takes advantage of others for one's own benefit means putting on the new life in Christ, where we give generously and joyfully to supply what is needed in the lives of others. The change is outward conduct. That the change is an outward uh, is an outward thing, but that change in our conduct is preceded by a change in our heart, and only Christ can transform us that way. Well, number four, uh, we are to discontinue unwholesome talk and speak edifying words. So in Ephesians four twenty nine through 30, it says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. This is about the hardest thing in the world for me because, you know, I was born with a silver foot in my mouth, and, 
and I can always, um, oftentimes I say what I think and I don't, I don't um, think about what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, so um, I've gotten better at that, but uh, I've gotten myself into trouble uh, doing it. But, and so it's important for us though to, uh, to avoid that kind of thing. So Paul turns from the way we use our hands to the way we use our mouths. So unwholesome, unedifying, or ungodly speech should not come out of our mouths. If we confess Jesus as Lord, we won't want to do that. And some, I mean, it's the hardest thing sometimes. You know, some people just, they just deserve it. They do. And, and well, you know what I mean. It, it, it becomes very, it can be very difficult. And the self-control is out of control. So Paul then is urging all believers to speak only what is helpful for building others up. Let your conversation this is what he says in Colossians 4, 6. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. It's really thinking about it and allowing the Holy Spirit to speak through us and not just to blurt out the things that come to our minds. And then we have in verse 30 this sol you know, a solemn interruption about grieving the Holy Spirit. Anything that is uh, not pleasing to the Lord is something that could be a grief to the Holy Spirit. And I think that, that for us, grieving the Holy Spirit, this is not like the unpardonable sin of a blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about things that that God knows we can do better, that he knows that if we would really fully put our trust in him and if we would lean on him, that we would avoid some of these, these evils. And if we would learn to lean on each other, each other in the family of God, in the community of believers, how, how much easier would it be for us to avoid some of these things that, that do grieve the Holy Spirit? Karl Barth, uh, the, you know, the well-known theologian, um, see, you know, saw expressed here an underlying possibility that those who grieve the Holy Spirit by continuing in their sin risk forfeiting future redemption. Now, I want to say this, that I don't think there's anything that we can do that is beyond redemption, but... Uh, at, but we, the, the, like I said earlier, the, the longer we allow things to, to gestate and become a part of our everyday life that are negative and that are bad or that are sinful, the easier it is to justify them, to say, well, that's just how I am, and God's going to have to accept me for that. But on the contrary, when we are continually dwelling on good things, on the things of God, and on what He has done, and on trying to learn the mind of Christ, in the same way, we are able to make more of ourselves. God makes us more than we are capable of. He allows us to be able to do things we could not do before. And I think that's Paul's point, really, is that just like if you spend too much time doing, doing evil or doing bad things or even not so bad things, it gets easier to do. In the same way, doing good worshiping, uh, being, uh, being in the mind of Christ gets easier the more we do it. And then finally, number five in verses 31 through 32, Paul tells us to get rid of malice and be forgiving. So he says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. So Paul concludes this, you know, this these this fivefold, um, uh, you know, cluster of negatives and positives that he began in verse twenty-five here. And so, you know, the the negatives point to the way of life that we are to put off 
when we come to Christ. And then the positive ones, of course, are those that uh, demonstrate what the life of Christ uh, in us should look like. So the six unholy attitudes and actions that were mentioned in verse uh, 31 stem from the root of malice. You know, malice is an active ill will toward other people. It's a poisonous source from which derives all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander. You know, bitterness, let's start there, is um, an irritable animosity that inclines us to harsh and uncharitable opinions of people and things. That's pretty sad. So, and, and, and then rage and anger, of course, we know what those are. They involve emotional resentment against another person. Brawling, uh, can, you know, is all kinds of outbursts, uh, contentious shouting. Slander is abusive speech towards someone else that tries to destroy them or to defame them. And so then the converse, the opposite of these things in, in verse 31 are these positive things, you know, uh, that he mentions. Be, in verse 32 it says, be kind. It really means to become kind. We know, again, it is a process that we have to, that we have to continually work on. Paul recognized that his readers have not yet attained maturity in these areas of the Christian graces. And so to become kind is to learn to exercise thoughtful consideration towards others. To become compassionate means to become tender-hearted. You know, it's, that's a rare word. And it expresses the deepest concern and feeling of our, for our fellowship and need. It is a quality that Jesus demonstrated when he saw the shepherdless multitudes or an individual in desperate need. Compassion is also part of our being conformed to Christ. So then besides this, then we have forgiveness. Forgiveness comes from the word for grace, charis. It's charis omenai. Charizomene way. Uh, to forgive each other is to show grace to one another. And I want to tell you that I need your grace. You need mine. We need each other's. We, don't, we need the grace of God, and thanks be to God that he gives it to us. But we need it from each other as well. It is vertical, but it is also horizontal, the grace that we have. Just as God's forgiveness flows from his grace, so our forgiveness of others is to flow freely from grace. I don't deserve forgiveness, but he gives it to me. And the same is true when we wrong each other, that we can sit back and say they don't deserve forgiveness. But that is an act of grace, not only for the person in need of it, but for us too, those, those who have been wronged and those who have done the wrong. Finally, Paul expresses the, cl the close association of Christ and the Father in our forgiveness. See, remember, it says, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. In the whole work of redemption, the Father and the Son act together. They act as one. It is in Christ that the Father has given us redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. There is a sense in which we too, when we are in Christ, Forgive others according to the riches of God's grace toward us. Thank God that we have that grace that he's given to us and that we can give to each other in our new life in Christ. Thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. Amen. Amen.